So I said we're coming back to architecture school with this topic, the topic of phenomenology. How many people have ever heard this word used before in the context of architecture? Where did you run into it? <coughs> Where? Landscape. Landscape. So that's true for everyone? What did you learn about it in landscape? What words do you associate with phenomenology? Like spirit place, of place, spirit of place. Dwelling. What is it? Dwelling. Dwelling. The essence. the essence of something. OK. That gives me a hint of what to emphasize and what not to emphasize. Um, so this is. Uh, some would say a classic topic in architecture, uh, and I would agree. It's also something that was in vogue uh, several decades ago, went out of vogue, and now it's back with a vengeance. And I think it's a good uh, development. It's good for us as professionals. It's good for the world. Um, so the first thing, I'm, the, the way I'm going to enter this is to place the issues of phenomenology in the context of other possible competitors to the issues of phenomenology. Um, and I'm going to go to the, the, the writing and thinking of a man by the name of Nelson Goodman. Nelson Goodman was a philosopher, but he wrote a very interesting piece called How Buildings Mean. And in this piece, just very briefly, he said that buildings mean in four different ways. Way number one Buildings mean what they mean because they spell it out. They write it right on the building. The Lincoln Memorial means what it means because it tells us, in this temple, as in the hearts of the people, for whom he saved the Union, etc. If you want to know what this building means, literally read it. It's there. So number one, uh, what do we call that? I can't remember, but it's, it's literally written in stone. It's etched in stone. The words are there. I'm sure it'll come to me. The second way that buildings mean what they mean is through what he called exemplification. It exemplifies what it means. It comes to mean what people experience by example. And so this is the point, uh, he used the word exemplification, we use experience. And the way we experience things is through our senses and through the movement of our bodies. And this is something that we'll dig into at much greater depth uh, in a later topic of this course. Um, but it's something, whether you realize it or not, this has been the home of your architectural education. Uh, and we'll get back to that. But this is the one that is nearest and dearest to our hearts as architectural educators and as explorers in the world of the architecture studio. Exemplification is uh, buildings mean because buildings do. And the, the, the fashionable term, uh, even though it's fashionable, I actually happen to think it's a very good term. It's a very healthy direction for us to be taking. The term is performance. Have you heard the word performance used in the studio? Or its bizarre derivative, performativity. You know, I should, I'm one to talk with my reflexivity, but still, it's a little weird. Performativity. Anyway, buildings mean what they mean because of what they do. This is new. It's not new in a way, but uh, when those of us who are uh, approaching middle age and who are teaching you, when we went to school, do? No. It's what is the metaphor, which brings us to the next one. But before we move on, the Lincoln Memorial means what it means because even if you're from, uh, you know, Turkey or sub-Saharan Africa or, you know, and you've never heard of this guy Lincoln and you've never seen a classical building before, if you're from Mars and you uh, and you are humanoid in, in form, and you teleport down to this place, you go, ah, oh. right, don't you? So you go, ah, oh. why do you go, ah? Oh. 
Well, it's because of the experience of this is pretty dramatic. And even when you step back and the experience of the space of the city, you say, hey, something important is happening here. There is a, a larger than life figure. He was a god. These people, these mortals worship this god and they build temples to this god. This is important. The water, the space, the axial symmetry, the arrangement of the view, the framing of the experience, the vast resources invested in this, something big is happening here. We know it, we feel it, even if we're from Mars, we get it. That's what we experience. The third method that buildings mean what they mean is through a metaphor, an, an analogy or previously established meanings. So our culture teaches us that classical columns uh, mean democracy and solidity and culture and humanity. Uh, the Martian has no idea that that's what these mean. It's a culturally learned uh, value system that is referred to in the vocabulary of form of this temple. So that's the third thing. And the fourth way buildings mean what they mean is because of what happens uh, in, around, about the building that has nothing really to do directly with the form itself. So the Lincoln Memorial gets put on a $5 bill. Is that the architecture? No. It's a, it's a, a source of meaning that is beyond the architecture itself. Sometimes buildings mean what they mean in ways that have nothing to do with the building. For example, there are famous houses that are just stupid little shacks, but George Washington slept there, so there's a, there's a protective uh, bubble around it and you can't touch a thing. It has nothing to do with the quality of the building itself. Uh, what else happened to, the Greek, to give meaning to the Lincoln Memorial? Well, many events have been held on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, not least of which being uh, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech that really galvanized the civil rights movement. And so this space, this building, uh, ha is suffused with a meaning where the source of which are the events that occur. And so in all of these different sources of meaning, they all come together to create the meaning of architecture. In this example, the Lincoln Memorial. Another vivid example, uh, despite the lack of vividness of the image, uh, is the World Trade Center. When it was built, it meant one thing. It meant modernity is alive and well and living in lower Manhattan. Sorry to everyone who's, whose houses were demolished in order to create this. Um, not such a great building. Architects hated it at the time, this whole complex. But what you're going to do? Um, then it took on a whole different meaning. Uh, well, it took on one set of meanings first that made it a target uh, and thus opened the door to taking on other meanings uh, when it was the target of the 9-11 attacks. Now, the memorial that is built in the footprint of the original towers uses all of these methods of meaning. The names of the victims are inscribed in stone. It's literally written in stone. Uh, the second meaning, the experiential, the phenomenological experience of the space, the water, the void. The, you can't see how deep this pit of sorrow is. It's, it's a, a deep uh, experience. Uh, experience to, you know, that you experience through all the senses, all the senses. You see it, you hear it, you feel the, the moisture, the moist air, the water vapor coming off it. You feel it on your skin. You feel the cold of the stone. Uh, it's a total uh, sensual experience. Uh, it's also the backdrop to weddings and memorial occasions uh, every year on 9-11. For the rest of our lives, uh, this will be in the backdrop of the te television cameras when the political leaders remember the day. So everything, uh, you, 
you can pretty much uh, be assured that each of the four sources of meaning, according to Nelson Goodman's uh, categorization, are going to be present uh, in buildings. Now, uh, in uh, this is a way of pointing out that there are other ways of experiencing architecture. There are other ways that meaning accrues to architecture. It's not just about experience. It's also about these other things. But all of these things, the special ingredient that architects offer, the real challenge, is to offer experience. And that is what we have been focusing on in your architectural educations. And that is really the test, is how can we get, how can we offer experience uh, that, uh, that is accessible to people? Um, when I was uh, going to school, we would look at a plan view and we would shift the grids because Peter Eisenman was, you know, an important teacher. And so we'd shift our grid and we'd orient it uh, to something meaningful uh, that was beyond the frame of experiential reference of anyone visiting that site. But that was okay. Because we showed it in plan. We established the meaning through architectural drawings even though no one after that point was ever going to know that our grid was shifted to align with the Statue of Liberty uh, 13 miles away. Uh, it was not experiential at all. We got away with that. That was fine because experience was not considered an, uh, the most important thing. Now it is, and I think this is a good um, move. Experience should matter. And we'll get into how experience uh, experience mattering in architecture is a move from non-reflexive to reflexive. If the test of architecture is that it must be beneficial to inhabitants who are directly experiencing that architecture, then it becomes reflexive. And that's why this is coming in at this point in the class. This is a fundamental value in architecture, and it happens to correspond quite nicely and powerfully and palpably is this really undeniable test of, uh, of the value in architecture. If architecture is considered to be good or bad reflexively and automatically dependent upon whether it moves and impacts the inhabitants in positive ways, then it is, uh, I'm basically saying uh, that phenomenology in architecture is reflexive. Architecture and the human experience of architecture is inherently a reflexive mechanism. Um, in getting into this issue of phenomenology, uh, one of the... It, it's interesting, when you read this reading, you'll start reading it and you'll say, Oh, I feel happy. This is quite pleasant reading. It makes me feel like, when I read this, it's like I'm eating a chocolate sundae. Not like that last thing he made us read. Why can't we always read chocolate sundae readings like this? Well, the reason you feel so happy, like you're eating chocolate, is because it's poetic and it, it's, it appeals to the senses. It stimulates the memory of pleasant experiences in childhood and growing up and, and in life. And, uh, and it, it really is a full-body experience of reading. So you should uh, be conscious of this. As you read this reading, what is it about it that's making you feel so happy? And I'm assuming you're going to feel happy. You might not feel happy. You might still uh, feel a little cranky. But um, we'll see. You'll have to tell me. But um, one of the reasons we love teaching phenomenology is because it's so accessible. Your only prerequisite is that you were a child at one point and that you now have access to full, your full five senses and you are a sensual uh, human being experiencing the world the way you are. That's really all you need to get into this and just love it and to become an excellent architect, uh, to, to appeal to that, to use architecture like Palasma does, uses words. Use architecture as a way to stimulate the positive sensations of life and celebrate the being human. 
Now, right before Palasma's essay, this theoretician from Montreal at McGill University, um, Alberto Perez uh, Gomez, wrote something that was also about phenomenology, but it was all Greek and heavy and difficult and impenetrable and uh, makes me not feel happy. Um, so there are, there are big theories associated with phenomenology, but the literature of phenomenology tends to be about sensual experience. And so you get Heidegger. How many people have read the Heidegger stuff? Dwelling and being. To dwell is to be, and to be is to live, and to live is to dwell, and to dwell is to be. Uh, it's great stuff if you don't try to think about it too much. It doesn't, it's kind of a circle. Did you notice that it went around in a circle? It's kind of circular. So that's the danger of this stuff, is it really is just self-reinforcing circular logic. But as you go around in that circle, it's actually quite pleasant. Um, Kent Bloomer and Charles Moore said, this stuff is important. How do we teach it to our freshmen at Yale? They wrote this book, and they basically um, they did an excellent job explaining it in fairly simple terms. As soon as we are born, or even before we're born, we are inside the mother's womb. And as soon as we're born, we have a vague recollection of what it was like to be in the womb. It was warm. It was enclosed. It was like a cave. And so for at least our childhoods and for most of our uh, lives, we kind, of, when we kind of feel comfortable in these warm, enclosed, womb-like dwellings. The Greeks always had an even number of columns to create a space for humans to occupy. Humans should occupy the void. If you put a column in the center, it displaces the humans. And if there's no place for the humans, it doesn't invite us. And so we project in our minds in space. We want to see that there's a place for humans, for ourselves. And if there is a place for ourselves, we look at it in a very positive way. If there's no place for ourselves, it looks ugly to us. Uh, the simple fact of enclosing a space makes us feel comfortable. And it feels comfortable because we uh, feel safe. And that has to do with the biological memory of the dangers out there in the world. And it extends to the three dimensions of a roof. Even if it's just a roof supported on columns, there is something special about the place that is designated by this enclosure, or even implied by the four columns, even before you put a roof on. So on a cathedral wall, the saints each have their own architectural individual enclosure. And so it's a similar uh, thing. Um, that's not working. Uh, but if it, uh, there's a theory of landscape painting that the reason, the reason that landscapes appeal to us and landscape paintings appeal to us, and I don't know if this came up in your landscape class. Let me know. Um, if we see a place for us, ourselves, for our body, if the visual information that our eyes are taking in tells us, yes, there is a path receding in the distance. It disappears beyond the hill and then appears again, rise on the next rise. There is an open field. You could run in that field if you were there. There is a tree offering shade, a good place for a nap or a picnic. Ah, what a lovely landscape. It is there for me. It is waiting for me to enter it. Even if I never enter that landscape, even if it is a painting on my wall, my ability to project myself into the space that is depicted gives me a positive response. It's the idea of empathy, of Einfühlung, to use the German, which is what we do sometimes. But don't freak out. Einfühlung, the reason we say it in German is because it refers to this whole genealogy of theoreticians who developed this idea that I'm telling you. It's a very simple idea. It's something that you can test for yourselves to see if you believe it. But uh, if, you walk down a, if you're walking down the street and you turn the corner and you're confronted with house after house or building after building with very small windows 
and the doors are just, are the, there's just doors on the facades, and there's not much of a front. It's just sidewalk and straight walls and, and small openings. You're like, eh, where's my pepper spray? Uh, I, just, I don't really feel safe, um, right? If you're a woman and you have pepper spray, because you do, right? Yeah. Okay, we'll have to talk. Um, now, you walk down the same street with the same crime statistics, but there are front porches, and there are stoops, and the doorways are recessed, and the windows are large. There's nobody on either one of these streets. Which street do you walk down? One has the straight facades and small windows. The other has porches and front stoops and recesses and large windows. I... I put the safety back on, the pepper spray, and I walk down the one with the porches. You know why? There may be no people there right now, but there could be any moment. Plus, even if there aren't any people, it feels inviting. I can project my body onto those porches, up those stairs, into those openings, through the windows. It receives... It, it, it inspires, it's a spatial condition that inspires empathy and projection. And this is the essence of architecture that satisfies the human biological need of taking the sum total of our bodily experience in life and before we were born and uh, gives it a place in the world around us, as opposed to a world that is simply Cartesian X, Y, Z. No one place is more important than any other place. Uh, it's two extremes, the Cartesian world and the world of bodily experience. And that's uh, the 20, the 18 minute version of uh, phenomenology. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Have a great weekend. <laughs>